Portland, Oregon, my home. It's a fairly small city compared to the rest in the United States. It's not a Houston or Chicago. If something fairly out of the ordinary happened in the area, the story would spread like wildfire. So when seven-year-old Karen Horman went missing, everyone and their moms were gossiping about the details they had. I remember the fear-mongering of possible child kidnappings afterward, as the media took the story and ran with it. You guys may remember the case being a bit confusing, or it may just be a distance memory now. So let me start from the beginning. June 4th, 2010. The second last Friday of the Skyline Elementary school year. Teachers and students alike were getting ready for summer vacation, turning in their last projects and assignments. Karen Horman was eager to start school that morning as it was a science fair day. He was a second grader after all. Life was exciting and his had barely started. Though he would usually take the bus, as they only lived two miles away, his stepmother named Terry Horman decided to drive him there on that day, alongside her baby daughter. They all boarded Terry's truck and headed over, arriving at the school at 8 a.m. Entering, they went to drop off Karen's coat and backpack at his classroom and proceeded towards the gym, where the science fair was being hosted, to set up his red-eyed tree frogs exhibit. After exploring the fair for a while, Terry and her baby daughter left the school at around 8.45 a.m. as classes were starting for the day. She last remembered seeing Kyron walking down the hall to his first class. However, Kyron was never seen in his first class and was instead marked as absent. Terry's statements to the police indicate that after leaving the school at 8.45 a.m., she ran errands at two different Fred Meyer grocery stores until about 10.10 a.m. Between then and 11.39 a.m., she stated that she was driving her daughter around town in an attempt to use the motion of the vehicle to soothe the toddler's headache. Terry said that she went to a local gym and exercised until 12.40 p.m. By 1.21 p.m., she had arrived home and posted photos of Kyron at the science fair on Facebook. At 3.30 p.m., Terry and her husband Kane walked with their daughter Kiara to the bus stop to meet Kyron. The bus driver told them that the boy had not boarded the bus and to call the school to ask for his whereabouts. Terry did so, only to be informed by the school secretary that as far as anyone there knew, Kyron had not been at the school since early that day and that he had accordingly been marked absent. Realizing then that the boy was missing, the secretary called 911. Where did he go? The school was first thoroughly searched, but unlike most elementary schools, they had no security cameras, meaning no lead. An interesting tidbit is that the school was pretty much open to anyone, not even requiring people to sign in when visiting. So where else could they look for him? Forest Park. Forest Park is a dense forest alongside Skyline Elementary School. Actually, it's one of the country's largest urban forest reserves, so it's not so surprising that a few shady things have happened there, including two murders. In 2001, Todd Allen Reed, a man who preyed upon heroin addicts and prostitutes, pleaded guilty to the 1999 murders of three women whose bodies were found in Forest Park near Northwest Saltzman Road. In 2003, Jurors convicted another man of the 1996 murder of his ex-girlfriend on a Forest Park trail. That being said, it was long speculated that Kyron Horman could be found there, prompting search efforts in the area, though it sadly led to nothing. In addition to the teams in the sky and on the ground, we're told about 50 detectives are also working the case. The focus, the area around the school. We're moving forward under the premise that we're looking for a, a living Kyron Horman. So what's up with the teachers? Why didn't they call Kyron's parents to inform them that he was absent? It's standard protocol, right? Terry had informed the school that Kyron needed to be excused due to a doctor's appointment, but due to miscommunication, they believed that it was on that day, although it wasn't until next week, leading to them not contacting the parents. According to Terry, Kyron had many seizures, would forget things, and walk into rooms with a blank face, acting strange. June 11, 2010. 
At this point, he was still considered as missing and not kidnapped. After facing some suspicion from the public for not talking, Kyron's family finally held a press conference. Finally, we would like to thank the media. If it was not for you showing Kyron on every newscast, his face would not be known to everyone. People from around the nation have seen his picture. This helps tremendously. Please help us bring Kyron home. The search effort was expanded to Savi Island, as it was the last place Terry's phone was tracked. The extensive search of the island led to nothing, though. These efforts stopped completely on June 13th, when the criminal investigation began. Who? Who was responsible for this? All of the family was being cooperative, even taking polygraph tests. Everyone passed, except for one person. Terry Horman, the last person to see Kyron. Though they may have seemed close in interviews and press conferences, Terry and her husband, Kane, were going through marital issues, family problems. See, Terry had a grudge against Kane due to him forcing her son to move out of their house months prior to the event, as Kane and her son didn't get along well with each other. It was also later discovered that Terry emailed a friend blaming Kyron as being the main issue in her relationship with Kane, as she detailed Kane as being abusive towards her believing that he was soon going to leave her. In late June 2010, in the midst of the search, Kane was reportedly told by investigators that Terry had offered their landscaper, Rodolfo Sanchez, a lot of money to kill her husband. Sanchez testified in a deposition that Terry approached him for help to kill her husband in January 2010, telling Rodolfo that he carried lots of money, an estimated $10,000 and a laptop on him everywhere he went. Five months before Kyron's disappearance. Though in her own deposition, Terry denied the charge, investigators convinced Sanchez to confront Terry undercover while wearing an audio surveillance device, but they were unable to obtain the evidence as she denied and called the cops and therefore they couldn't make an arrest. On June 28th, Kane filed for divorce and obtained a restraining order against Terry. The divorce was granted and Terry was eventually granted supervised visitation with her daughter. It wasn't the first time Terry was connected to a murder-for-hire plot either. It is alleged that in the 1990s, she tried to get her boyfriend at the time, Sean Ray, killed. He remembered a strange man sneaking up on them while eating food at the park and pointing a gun right at him. When Terry Horman screamed, he's here for you, as she ran off. Though the man didn't pull the trigger and instead bailed. This put her at a disadvantage in the public eye, as she was now suspicious. Terry was even found to have flirted with another man through text messages found by the police. Keep in mind, this was after Kyron went missing. Nothing she did after helped her case. In July 2010, a Monoma County grand jury subpoenaed several friends of Terry, including Dee Dee, whom Young and Kane described as having been in communication with Terry, and providing Terry with support and advice that was not in the best interest of their son. On the day of Kyron's disappearance, Dee Dee abruptly left her work gardening for a homeowner on Germantown Road in Northwest Portland around 11.30 a.m. and returned around 90 minutes later. She also allegedly helped Terry purchase an untraceable cell phone, though Dee Dee would go on to lawyer up. On June 1, 2012, Young filed a civil lawsuit against Terry, claiming that she was responsible for the disappearance of Kyron. The lawsuit attempted to prove that Terry had kidnapped Kyron on the day he disappeared. Young sought $10 million in damages. On August 15, 2012, a federal court judge denied a motion by Terry to delay the lawsuit. In early October 2012, Dee Dee refused to answer any of the 142 questions posed to her during a deposition regarding Young's lawsuit. Among these questions were several regarding Dee Dee's whereabouts on June 4, 2010, and her contact with Terry on that day. She also declined to identify a photo of Kyron, whether she had met him or not, and whether she knew his father, Kane. During testimony provided by Kane in a separate hearing the same year, he stated that the police had told him they have more probable cause to think Terry Horman was involved in Kyron's disappearance than they did two years ago. On July 30th, 2013, it was announced that Young had dropped a lawsuit against Terry so as to not interfere with the ongoing police investigation. They're, uh, again, asking us to help protect the information as much as we can so it doesn't interfere with the integrity of what they're doing, and uh, we're, we're doing our best in the civil arena to do that. Again, at the same time, trying to press forward to find Kyron and protect my daughter. 
Here is an age progression photo of what he would look like as of 2022. If you have any information, call the Monoma County Sheriff tip line. Thanks for watching.